my name is Jared Goplin. Uh, like Matt had introduced, uh, I'm kind of filling in for Craig Schaefer. So I think he was kind of the, the original uh, uh, person that was going to give this talk, but uh, Craig's not able to, to make it today. So I'm sort of standing in uh, and talking a little bit about establishing and managing productive uh, alfalfa stands. So this is kind of, uh, in some ways, a checklist. Uh, you know, my understanding is that most of the, the viewers here today are, are farmers. You know, they might be producing alfalfa or, or uh, have uh, beef cattle or dairy cattle in some, some way. So uh, kind of a checklist. So as we go through this presentation, uh, different things to think about when you're producing alfalfa to really maximize production uh, and quality and some of those things. So um, if you have any questions, uh, certainly uh, type them in the chat. Uh, if I can see them, I can uh, answer them kind of as we go. And and uh, certainly a really good program on today. So uh, questions that I can't answer, I'm sure somebody else uh, here could, because there's a lot of experience on the call here today. So a uh, quick outline of what I'm going to be covering, a little bit on agronomics. So of course, a little bit, very little on variety selection and uh, getting those stands established. And we'll talk a little bit about management then and uh, you know, kind of how to manage these stands for maximum production. And then uh, some of the equipment interactions there because ultimately uh, alfalfa and other forages are, are one of those crops that really struggle with uh, harvest and storage losses. Uh, you know, compared to corn and soybeans and other commodity crops, uh, you know, there's not a lot of losses to deal with, but it's not uncommon to have 30%, 50% of what you produce as forage uh, be lost before it hits the feed bunk. So there's obviously a lot of potential there, and I think it is worth uh, at least mentioning. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, today as well. Before I go any farther, there is an excellent resource that is available online uh, for anyone, and that's the Alfalfa Management Guide. has uh, just a lot of really great stuff uh, has been put together and uh, sort of modified over the years, but uh, the link is there, or if you just Google Alfalfa Management Guide, it will pop up. Uh, certainly a, a great resource and uh, you know, a number of the, the things I'll be talking about today are covered or, or actually steal some of the graphs from this, this uh, publication. So uh, I wanted to mention that that is a, a great resource that is available. So when it comes to managing and uh, producing productive uh, forage stands, alfalfa or if it's, it's uh, perennial grasses or other forages, at the end of the day, yield is uh, really the primary factor driving profitability. Um, so here's a, a graph that we pulled from the FinBin uh, data set, which is basically a conglomerate data set of Minnesota and other states, uh, folks that are part of, uh, our, of uh, farm financial management programs uh, that report some of their yield and input costs and uh, returns. And basically this graph just shows yield on the horizontal axis here. Uh, I'm not sure, hopefully you can see my mouse here, but uh, yield on the horizontal axis here, and then net return in dollars per acre per year on that, uh, that vertical axis. And this is from 27 to 2019. But if you look at that sort of zero mark, you can see it's kind of a break even point when you're producing about four tons of alfalfa per acre. Now, uh, as you go higher, obviously those, that, that net return per acre is gonna go up. And this, this is uh, basically the report for cash rented acres and would include both uh, commercial producers as well as uh, those producing livestock. Uh, so, so if they are producing livestock, they're attributing some value uh, back to that alfalfa production. But really the point is simple that uh, we need to maximize yield to maximize profitability. If, if we spend all this money and time managing uh, these, these stands and we're only getting three or four tons per acre, um, you know, we're, we're, there's a lot less left on the, on the table. And I think we can maximize production um, if, we, if we pay a little bit closer attention to some things. So how can we maintain you know, that high level of production and, and maintain you know, economics? Uh, so that's kind of the, the theme of today's presentation. And you know, the first step, uh, I wanted to start with fertility and uh, soil pH because you know, these are things that you need to think about years in advance of actually establishing alfalfa. Uh, alfalfa is a crop that uh, is pretty sensitive to soil pH. So if you have really acidic soils, you know, uh, like for instance, in Eastern Minnesota, um, you know, having low soil pH acidic soils can certainly affect production. So we need to make sure we're testing that a couple of years in advance and getting that soil pH corrected um, so that we're able to, uh, to maximize production. Because if we don't, we're gonna have issues with, uh, with establishment and certainly with production. Um, the other side of that is alfalfa. You know, as we're move, removing, you know, five, six tons of dry matter per acre per year, there's a lot of nutrients in that. Um, so here's kind of the graph on the right-hand side or table just shows how much, uh, how many nutrients, you know, kind of the book values uh, of, of things are moving off the field um, with alfalfa. So, you know, there's about 14 pounds of, of phosphorus, P205, you know, 60 pounds of, of potash. 
Uh, so there is a lot of, of fertilizer leaving that field and, and we need to make sure we're adding that back in via manure or, or, um, or fertilizer of some kind to make sure we can maintain that higher level of produ production. So liming, uh, here's kind of the map of Minnesota from the University of Minnesota recommendations. Uh, but, you know, the eastern part of the state, you know, tends to have a little bit more acidic soils. And, uh, you know, that's where, you know, we need to especially be thinking about liming our alfalfa, alfalfa ground. So ideally, we want to be in that six and a half to seven pH range, so a little bit higher than some of the other crops, um, you know, like corn or even like red clover and some of those others. And it is the single most important fertility concern uh, for, for growing alfalfa. So it's going to affect the availability of other nutrients, and it's also going to uh, affect the establishment success as well as persistence uh, ability. And uh, just like, you know, all the recommendations when it comes to liming, you know, we need to think about that ahead of time because that lime needs a little bit of time to react with the soil and uh, actually, uh, you know, increase that soil pH. Now I'm sitting uh, in uh, basically Southern Lac Parle uh, County and in this neck of the woods, you know, most of our soils are, are not acidic. So, um, you know, in some cases, um, you know, we've got soils that are in the seven and a half or even up to eight uh, range, which of course, uh, there's not really anything you can do about that, but uh, liming is a little bit less of a concern uh, depending on where you're at. So here's a graph from, uh, from that alfalfa management guide, some work done in Wisconsin showing basically the interaction of pH on the horizontal axis here and dry matter yield on the vertical axis. So if alfalfa economics is driven by yield and we've got a soil pH of, you know, 5.5 or 5, you know, we're leaving a lot of yield on the table by not correcting that. So really want to be up in that six and a half uh, to seven range to maximize uh, yield. So make sure you pay attention to, uh, to fertility, uh, pH, those types of factors, you know, uh, in advance of seeding alfalfa. And uh, once we get into sort of the seeding decisions, that's where, you know, variety selection is certainly uh, uh, an important factor here. Uh, a couple screenshots here of some resources available, you know, NAFA, the Alfalfa uh, Forage Alliance, uh, does publish these alfalfa variety ratings that have uh, some, some good information on winter survival and uh, pest resistance and dormancy factors. Uh, got an older copy uh, screenshot of the Minnesota field crop trials uh, and other variety trials. You know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the public uh, variety trial programs have not been uh, particularly active. And, and, you know, like Minnesota, we, we basically don't have a variety trial program anymore due to lack of submissions and whatnot. So selecting, you know, uh, varieties based on these, these trials, you know, is a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, a lot of these trials are done within companies and, and it does make it harder to compare between companies to make sure you're selecting, uh, you know, good varieties with high yield. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, work with a reputable seed supplier and uh, in select varieties that have good winter survival. Uh, you know, in the upper Midwest in Minnesota, that is a big concern, especially when we have years without snow or with, uh, you know, really open and cold winters. Thankfully, much of, of the state does have a decent blanket of snow that's going to protect that this year. Um, so make sure we're selecting uh, good varieties that are going to survive a couple of years and uh, as well paying attention to yield potential uh, disease. Uh, that's another factor that, you know, for the most part, the, the biggest uh, consideration with managing disease is, is variety selection. So uh, making sure, you know, if you know which diseases you're, you're going to probably have issues with, uh, select varieties accordingly so that you don't have to uh, try to manage them with fungicides and those types of things. So here's something to consider when it comes to, to seed. And, and it's, it's really kind of a, a challenging uh, topic in many ways, just with that lack of, uh, you know, public variety trials nowadays. But, um, you know, in many cases, it does pay to spend a little bit more money on seed if, if it leads to higher yield or, or more persistent varieties. So, you know, an extra $2 a pound when you're buying that seed. So, uh, you know, a hundred bucks a bag difference can make up for itself with even just 0.1 tons per acre of production. So, you know, when you are establishing a perennial crop that's going to be there for several years, uh, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of additional yield to pay for that seeding expense when you're dividing that expense across the, you know, three or four years of the stand. So, um, you know, it is a hard thing to consider, you know, especially when seed prices vary so much, but, uh, you know, make sure you're selecting uh, good varieties is really the, the take home there. So seeding rate, you know, when seed is kind of expensive, uh, we do need to be paying really close attention to our establishment uh, strategies as well as seeding rates. So uh, here's a study that was done in North Dakota. Um, 
a couple of years ago. Uh, basically, I converted the, uh, the the metric units on the horizontal axis of, of seeding rate to pounds per acre. Uh, it is still metric uh, megagrams per hectare, but it's approximately tons per acre, uh, if you want to kind of think of it that way. But um, really, that maximum uh, yield, total forage yield, is going to be maximized uh, in this study was kind of in that, that uh, 13, 15 uh, pounds per acre range. And that's where many of the, the university recommendations are uh, in that sort of 12 to 15 pounds per acre range, uh, a little bit lower if you have really light soils as you get further west. But, uh, you know, really in, in much of Minnesota, um, it's kind of in that 12 to 15 pound range. Now, the other factor here is, uh, is what are we talking about with seeding rate? You know, many of these are, are considering pure live seed in terms of pounds per acre. But of course, a lot of the seed available now has uh, various coatings, you know, it might be 30 or, or more percent, uh, you know, some type of a clay coating on the seed. And, uh, you know, so that's where it is important to pay attention to that pure live seed that's actually in the bag of seed and uh, sort of convert back to uh, that pure live seeding rate of, of that 12 to 15 pounds. Uh, so it might mean, you know, if you have a, a you know, significant seed coating, you know, you have a higher seeding rate than that total, but, uh, but uh, considering uh, on, uh, and, and yes, I guess I just saw the question here from Jim. This, this would be pure live seed basis, I believe. And Jared, uh, there was a question you, you were talking about liming, and there was a question from the group here about, uh, is there an advantage between high cal lime and regular lime uh, as regular lime um, can have, you know, higher levels of magnesium? Um, and does that have any relationship to, to corresponding yield? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, really, when it comes down to uh, liming, you know, we're looking at, at neutralizing power or effective neutralizing power. So that should be a, uh, something that you can, can get for whatever your lime source is. Now, I, I, don't, I cannot comment on uh, the excessive amounts of magnesium lowering yields. Um, I don't have any experience there. Maybe there's someone else on the call here that, that would, uh, but I just don't have an answer. So if somebody uh, does, uh, feel free to speak up, I guess. Gotcha. Thanks for that. Um, and then I'm assuming stand counts will be coming a little bit later in your presentation. Yeah, I did have a couple of uh, slides. I think I might have hidden that one, um, but here I'll unhide it real quick and uh, I can show that one uh, here just to uh, demonstrate that. So uh, there it is. So in terms of stand count, and that's one that's, <laughs> it's always a little depressing to me uh, when we talk about alfalfa. Uh, or, or these other forages, um, because, you know, when you're planting corn, you know, you're seeding, you know, 34,000 seeds per acre, you know, and you're going to get, you know, 33,000 that are going to grow. Uh, when it comes down to uh, seeding alfalfa, we're seeding a lot of seed. And at the end of the day, by the end of the stand, uh, the total number of plants per square foot is, is going to be down, you know, maybe uh, four plants per square foot. Uh, so here, here's just showing the total seeds per square foot in this instance. Uh, on the left is that seeding. This is 12 pounds of pure live seed per acre. Uh, you can see germination. You know, it's it's uh, you know not quite uh, half of that, or a little better than half. And then uh, plants after the first winter, it's it's maybe a third of what you had originally seeded. So, um, you know, it is kind of uh, depressing in some ways to think that uh, so many of those seeds are are actually going to die off. But uh, but that is kind of the the sweet spot in terms of maximizing, uh, you know, uh, that uh, first year uh, and early early. Uh, stand life uh, yields as well as long-term as well. Yeah, and I guess there is another question here or, or comment in terms of gypsum versus lime um, uh, as well there. So, so that's another good one. And it looks like Margaret uh, had, a, had a comment there uh, in terms of uh, high magnesium won't limit yields. Uh, make sure to get your forage samples analyzed though in balance rations. So good point. Thanks, Margaret. Great, thanks. That's one of the nice things of having a lot of experience on the call here. So thank you for that. So uh, that's all I'm really gonna talk about in terms of variety selection. Uh, certainly you could spend all day talking about some of that, but um, you know, seed at the end of the day is, is expensive and we don't want to um, you know, spend a bunch of mon money on seed, uh, spend the time to, to plant it and then have a failure. So what are some of the keys to doing that right? Uh, well, number one is a firm seed bed. Uh, and that basically means uh, that you, you, your foot doesn't sink in more than about three eighths of an inch. I think the next slide has a picture of that, um, regardless of how you're establishing it. So whether it's a drill, uh, you know, we really want to have a press wheel uh, on that drill or utilizing a brilliant seeder. Any of those strategies work quite well. Um, and uh, it, it does uh, depend some, somewhat on, on whether or not you're going to seed, uh, you know, companion crop in there. Um, 
but ultimately we want, we want to have good seed to soil contact and, uh, and really uh, do a good job with establishment because that's kind of our one chance. Uh, and if we have poor establishment, you know, our options for interseeding, uh, you know, sometimes aren't, uh, aren't as ideal if, if we do have issues. So uh, loose soil is the biggest one. Um, you know, this last year we were really dry in this neck of the woods and, uh, you know, some of the stuff that had fall tillage last fall uh, was just totally fluffy uh, on that soil surface. I mean, and you could sink in uh, three, four inches and uh, that's obviously too, too fluffy. We really want to have it firm. Uh, in some cases, you know, maybe it means you have to, to run over it with a, a packer or a roller of some kind to, to firm that seed bag bed up. Uh, but we want to have a relatively firm seed bed and seed it about a quarter to a half an inch. Uh, typically, uh, we can go deeper on some lighter soils. Uh, soil pH. It's another one here. Uh, if we didn't correct the soil pH, we can have issues there. And uh, this is a big one. I probably should have put some more emphasis on this this year. But herbicide carryover is is a big concern going into next year. Uh, as uh, we were pretty dry this last year in much of the, the uh, state. And uh, dry weather basically means that uh, a lot of these herbicides we used in preceding crops uh, aren't going to break down uh, as well as they normally would. So it is something I would uh, definitely take a look at what, what you use for herbicides in the last year and, uh, and make sure you're not gonna have, uh, have issues there. Even if you are outside that restriction, uh, I've still seen plenty of cases where if you have weird, weird weather, dry weather, you can still, uh, still see issues there. Yeah, those are awesome recommendations. There's a um, there's a question on um, seeding alfalfa with grass in a mixture, and I'm going to hold that question for our next presenter because uh, we have a uh, Jerry Cherney from Cornell University talking about that specific uh, topic. So we'll hold that question until the next session. Perfect. Um, all right. So the next thing I've got in here, kind of in our checklist as we go through uh, managing productive stands. Uh, now think, all right, I've got the haste established. I've got that field and it's, it's a good stand out there. I did, did a good job with establishment. What's next? Uh, well, we need to scout for insects and disease. You know, disease typically is going to go back to variety selection and kelp can help inform your, your future variety selections. Uh, um, in many cases, some cases you might need some fungicides, but insects are going to be the big, bigger concern. So we've got a potato leaf hopper here on the left and a, an alfalfa weevil on the right. Uh, keeping an eye on that that crop is is going to be important, and uh, for the most part, you know, independent crop consultants or or crop scouts, um, you know, I think if you're not going to go out and scout fields yourself, um, I think they're money well spent in many cases because, uh, you know, years like this, alfalfa weevil uh, was pretty detrimental to some some folks. Typically, we see those generations taper off after the first cutting. You know, kind of that uh, early June time frame, they're sort of wrapping up. Uh, we can manage that with cutting in many cases, but uh, this year we sort of had this, this uh, Western biotype, as Bruce Potter has been calling it, that has an extended pattern of, uh, of uh, feeding. So uh, basically that one, we did see some significant yield reductions in parts of the state in, in the second crop and, and in the third crop in some cases as well. So it is important to, uh, to keep an eye on, on those insects. So now we're going to move into some, some management here in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, equipment. So, uh, you know, I showed that, that slide at the beginning that showed that forage yield is gonna be the primary driver of economics and profitability. So uh, cutting height, you know, if any of you are chopping silage as well, the same is true with alfalfa. The closer to the ground you cut, the higher your yield's gonna be, um, but it also can, uh, will decrease quality to some degree. So alfalfa typically or other forages, you think of, you know, cutting it fairly close to the ground. But, uh, you know, just as an example, going from a two inch cutting height to a four inch cutting height, you know, can equate to a, a ton less yield over the season. So, um, you know, it is, it is something where we want to cut close enough to the ground, but not too close that we are, uh, you know, actually uh, causing harm to any of those, those buds or those crowns or, uh, or sucking up additional dirt. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the ability for all the disc spines that are, you know, commonly used now to actually, you know, add ash content to that hay by sucking up the dirt. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, that cutting height, though, you know, just like when you're chopping silage, the lower you go, it's, uh, you know, a little bit more stems, a little bit lower quality. So we will decrease quality slightly um, here in this work in Wisconsin was about eight points from that two inches difference in cutting height. But ultimately, this graph on the right hand side shows, uh, you know, milk production per acre. So pounds per acre, you know, that is uh, an equation that uh, basically calculates uh, based on yield as well as quality. And uh, we still do maintain maximum, um, you know, yield or milk per acre with, uh, 
with a lower cutting height, even though there is a slight reduction in quality. But that is something you can manage uh, to some degree if you're, you know, for instance, you get delayed in cutting and, and you want a, uh, a little bit higher quality, uh, you can play around with that to some degree. Mm -hmm. Jared, there's several questions coming out. I'm going to try to kind of filter through some of them. Uh, do you, did you show a rate for lime or um, gypsum earlier on that maybe maybe we missed, or do I you did, have a, kind of a blanket recommendation there? I did not, and uh, really that's going to depend on the uh, the effective neutralizing power of whatever your liming product is. And uh, I can put the link to the university recommendations. Um, in in the uh, the chat. So uh, once I wrap up here, if uh, I can put that in the chat um, because they are they're fairly straightforward. Um, if you have a, a pH or a uh, or a buffer test uh, from your soils, basically for that recommendation. Thanks. So what does this mean uh, in terms of cutting height? Uh, really, it's kind of that two and a half to three inch mark is sort of the 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 recommendation. Uh, you know, if there's grasses in the mix, and and I think Jerry might talk about this a uh, little bit later. Uh, those perennial grasses are more sensitive to lower cutting height because they need that that additional uh, sort of uh, leaf area um, to to grow back quicker. So uh, we can affect yield there long term if we cut too low. So if you do have grasses in the mix, which you know more people I think are are planting some grasses with their alfalfa uh, in Minnesota or the Upper Midwest now. Um, so if that's the case, you really want to be on the higher end of that uh, just to to be a little more protective of those grasses. Some other factors, uh, stressed stands, uh, and this would be a similar uh, concept as what I just mentioned with grasses. Uh, when, whenever that alfalfa is stressed, so you got some flooding issues or winter injury. Uh, this last year, drought was a, was a concern. Um, you know, when they're stressed, you know, increasing that cutting height a little bit can help them grow back a little bit quicker. And then in the fall, you know, if we're going to uh, uh, harvest the, the stand a couple more years and you want to help it persist, uh, leaving a little bit more cutting height can help capture the snow. So in many cases, you know, a lot of these disc binds, you kind of let the, let the bar down and then it'll tip down a little bit further. Um, you know, many cases that last cutting, you know, just lock it up so it's not tipping down and, and uh, cutting right on the ground. Uh, leave a little bit more to help capture that snow and give a little more of insulation. So then I'm going to talk just uh, briefly about disc mower blades, because I know a lot of the hay is cut nowadays with disc mowers. Um, you know, of course, there's a lot of benefits. You can drive faster and, and all kinds of things. But, um, you know, there's also some considerations because they're also really good at sucking up dirt. Uh, they're like your lawnmower and they can basically create a lot of suction and actually suck that hay up. Uh, especially when we have blades that have a higher pitch. So you can see the middle one in the picture or that that increased angle on the right hand photo. Um, those increased pitch will create more suction and it's really good at picking up lodged forage. So if you do have a, a field that the hay all tipped over, um, you know, using a higher pitch can help you capture more of that yield. But if you don't have lodged uh, forage, they also are really good at picking up dirt. And uh, I saw that in many cases this year, uh, guys that use those really high pitch blades, um, as we had a lot of drought issues, that upper soil uh, just kind of turned to a powder in some cases, and, uh, and it really made it easy for those high suction blades to pick up more, more dirt. And uh, ultimately, that's going to be, you know, detrimental to uh, forage quality. Uh, it's going to increase your ash content, and, and at the end of the day, the dirt isn't, uh, <laughs> isn't giving your cows any nutrition. Next consideration with cutting is, is wide swaths. So the recommendation is to cut hay in a wide swath, and what does that mean? Uh, it means 70% of your width of cut or more is uh, kind of the recommendation. And the reason for that is because we talked about harvest losses and losses when it comes to forage. Uh, we can easily lose 30 to 50% of what's standing in the field before it gets to the bunk uh, if we're not careful. And, and the first step in that is, uh, is drying rate. So the first kind of uh, goal when you cut that hay is you want to get it down to about 60, 65% moisture as fast as you can. Because in that time, after you cut the plant, it's still alive, it's still uh, respiring, it's still burning up uh, sugars basically to survive. Um, and until that moisture gets dry enough, it's going to continue to do that. And that first kind of phase uh, from 80 to 60% moisture is primarily uh, due to stomatal openings. So what is the stomata? There are little tiny holes in the leaves of the, of the, of the hay, of the alfalfa. And basically it's how the, the alfalfa gets uh, CO2 in and oxygen out. Uh, and it's also where water leaves the plant. So it's how it sucks nutrients up from the ground. And, uh, and if we can keep those stomata open, we can get the, the drying rate uh, a lot faster. And the way to keep those stomata open are to keep them in the sun. 
The only way to keep them in the sun after you're cutting it is to keep them in a wide, wide wind row. So there's more of those stomata that are exposed to the sunlight and stay open. And, uh, and we can get that dried down to that 60% mark uh, quicker uh, and actually hold on to some more of those sugars. So we're not burning up both uh, dry matter yield as well as quality. So here's a, a kind of a chart that, uh, that comes from some Wisconsin, um, a Wisconsin publication here showing percent moisture on the vertical axis and hours after cutting on the horizontal axis. So, you know, the hay is usually around 80% moisture when you cut and a wide swath in this instance, more than 70% of that width of cut is going to dry down a lot faster. That's the dotted line here. And if we look at that 60% mark, um, you know, it only took, took about five hours in this case to get to that 60% uh, moisture range. You know, the wide swath, or the, sorry, the narrow swath took about twice as much time. So if we think about what that means then over the course of that drying period, uh, it's gonna continue to burn up a little bit more of those sugars, uh, at least down to the 60% mark. I should have that arrow a little higher. And that does uh, basically cause some changes in quality as well. Uh, kind of the flip side of this is, uh, you know, that wide swath is gonna give you on average, uh, it's about 60, 70% of the time, it'll give you higher quality, uh, a little bit higher crude protein, uh, and the RFQ is going to be about 10 points higher, uh, according so to some of this work that's been done on the wide swaths. How wide is that? So, uh, you know, it's easy to say 70%, but uh, until you kind of look at what that looks like, it is a really wide swath. So if you've got a 12 foot mower, that's eight and a half feet wide. So what does that mean? If you're cutting with a, with a disc bind and a tractor, it means you're going to drive on the windrow. And uh, unless the ground is really wet or some other considerations, uh, driving on the wind row is, is kind of uh, better uh, in many cases than, uh, than, than having a narrower swath just based on that drying rate. So, uh, you know, really the take home is don't be afraid to drive on the, on the wind row to some degree, uh, depending on the conditions, especially um, because that wide swath is going to, to really help you uh, get that drying rate faster. All right, so the next thing is after we cut it, we got to rake it or merge it uh, to some degree to either chop it or bale it. And uh, there's some work done in Minnesota and, and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin uh, a few years ago, been other work elsewhere as well, but looking at types of rakes or mergers. And uh, ultimately a merger top left is going to be the best option for minimizing the amount of dirt that ends up in that hay. Um, because like we talked about before, uh, that dirt isn't providing any nutrient value. Um, the, uh, the rotary rakes are going to, on the top right, uh, be pretty good as well. Uh, same with those sidebar rakes in the bottom right. Really the worst of any of the rake, uh, rakes out there are the wheel rakes. You know, unfortunately, they're the cheapest, so uh, you know, are pretty widely uh, used, uh, but they're, they're by far the most uh, risky in terms of getting dirt in that hay, uh, as well as rocks and other things like that. Now, that, uh, it's not to say that if you have a wheel rake, uh, you know, they can do a pretty good job, but we need to make sure they're, they're set properly. So make sure they're not scratching into the soil. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, you, you uh, have a little bit steeper uh, roll angle on that rake. Uh, certainly can help, um, help you do a better job of picking up that hay and, uh, and not bringing that, uh, that soil into the, the wind roll. So here's what that, uh, that study basically showed. So um, on this table, we got uh, the three different states, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. And we got the four different rake types that I just showed. So mergers, rotary rakes, sidebar, and wheel rakes. Uh, and then if we look uh, on the right-hand side here, we basically have the ash content is what, what these numbers are showing uh, of the stand after we mowed, and then finally after we raked it. Uh, Minnesota, you can see uh, based on these little letters, they basically tell you whether or not those numbers are different, actually different or not. And uh, Minnesota, the merger was significantly better than the rest. Um, in Pennsylvania, the wheel rake was significantly worse than the rest of them. And then Wisconsin, there was actually no significant differences, uh, despite some of the numbers being a little bit different. Basically, it means there was enough variability in the data that we can't prove that, that uh, there was any differences there. So what's the take home here is, is yeah, on average, the wheel rake is, is maybe a little bit worse. But if we're adjusted properly, and that's my suspicion in Wisconsin, it's probably that the, the rake, because these were different pieces of equipment used, uh, it was probably set a little bit differently, maybe a different operator, and uh, maybe did a little bit better job at minimizing ash content uh, and the ability for that rake to pick up uh, dirt and put it in that windrow. 
And I just want to acknowledge there's been uh, quite a few questions on the chat, but I, we're just going to keep uh, plowing ahead here. And if there's time at the end, we'll kind of circle back to some of those. So I just, if you if you feel like I'm ignoring you, don't don't uh, feel bad. We'll we'll circle back at the end here. So uh, I do see the comment about uh, not using your hay rakes as tillage tools, and uh, yes, you're spot on. It's kind of uh, gets me to chuckle because uh, I actually just had a mm -hmm. uh, a, uh, a gentleman in. Uh, north uh, central Minnesota that had some uh, kind of an old meadow uh, with some moss growing and uh, and trying to figure out how to aerate that a little bit and uh, that's one situation where uh, you know using your hay rake as a tillage tool uh, can actually be beneficial uh, kind of scratches that moss up and, and aerates it a little bit so in some cases they work well as tillage tools but uh, unfortunately in your uh, alfalfa field it's probably not the the best uh, best idea so thank you for that comment all right, so the next thing, if we think about pieces of equipment getting really close to the ground is, uh, is the pickups on either your baler or your chopper. Uh, you know, we need to make sure we're maintaining that and replacing any fingers, obviously, that's kind of common sense. But if we don't, uh, we're gonna leave some hay behind and, and hay left in the field is, is obviously uh, not going to help you uh, feed your cows or, or make any money. So uh, don't scratch soil, same recommendation there. You know, make sure you have it adjusted properly. Uh, and the other thing, just kind of a reminder, is to match your ground speeds with, with your pickup speed or the PTO speed. Um, you know, so, you know, these newer balers, especially, you know, you can drive pretty darn fast, but we still need to be uh, mindful of not driving too fast that we're leaving hay behind or too slow. Uh, if you're like my uh, dad or grandpa, sometimes I think they drive too slow. Uh, and that's where, uh, you know, you can actually comb through that windrow. And uh, especially with dry hay, if, if uh, you know, if that uh, PTO speed's too fast or you're driving too slow, uh, it's actually going to knock leaves off before it gets into the bale chamber. So, um, you know, that's kind of the last line of, uh, of defense in some ways to protect that yield that's out there. Jared, is there a recommendation on when to cut? I know sometimes people recommend you cut in the morning. Sometimes people recommend cutting in the afternoon. Is there, is there kind of a best practice at a glance there or does it depend on the weather? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, a, that's a challenging one because uh, throughout the course of the day, and that's where some of the, you know, that, that work has been done is, you know, in the morning, you have the most sunlight after your cut, you cut to actually get that hay down below 60% moisture, um, you know, hopefully by the end of the day. But at the same time, the later in the day you go, that plant is going to photosynthesize and actually builds some of the sugars uh, in, the, in, those, uh, in those leaves. So you actually can increase some of the carbohydrates throughout the day. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, the morning is probably I ideal just to maximize drying rate. But, you know, in many cases, people have, uh, you know, it's an equipment issue. So, um, you know, you'd probably need an extra, you know, uh, hay bind or something like that to actually get it all cut, you know, before noon in the morning. And then you, a lot of times you have dew to worry about too. Um, but uh, so, you know, in general, you just kind of do it when you can, when the, when the weather allows, that's the real world. Kind of recommendation in my mind, but uh, but morning in some ways is is nicer because you maximize the sunlight throughout the day. So it looks like we're getting pretty close on time here. So I'll I'll quickly mention the last few things. So uh, next things on on balers make dense bales, especially with uh, uh, baleage being a more common thing. You know I'm sure a number of you on the call have been wrapping bales. Uh, basically max out, peg out that, uh, get as much pressure on that bale chamber as you can, because it's the same concepts as making silage. Uh, we need to have basically the least amount of water, or sorry, airspace in those bales. So we need to use uh, dense bales. Uh, any of you storing hay uh, outside, um, a dense bale is gonna shed water a little bit better and use net wrap. So if you're storing it outside, especially uh, it does shed water better. There's some work showing about 30% less losses in the, in the uh, row of bales uh, over the course of a storage period uh, with, with net wrap bales compared to twine. Because uh, it basically just allows you to get a better, better thatch layer there, uh, lays all that, uh, that forage down and allows it to shed water a little bit better. Uh, and here's basically the, the, the graph from uh, Dr. Kevin Shinners in Wisconsin showing twine wrapped on the left, net wrapped on the right. Red is good. Uh, other colors down to blue is bad. Basically means more moisture uh, because it's able to soak into the sides of that bale a little bit better in twine and uh, wick up from the bottom as well uh, on the bottom of that bale. So the last little thing I want to mention is storage losses. So, you know, I've got a pile of corn here uh, that's basically just rotting away. We would never consider allowing that to happen with our grain crops. Um, but in reality, storing hay outside is, is doing the same thing. And in some cases, if you're not doing a good job of storing hay, you can lose easily 30 to 50% of that crop. 
So imagine just burning half of your bales before you even haul them off the field. I mean, you would never consider that. So think about your bale storage structure. You know, obviously inside's best, but we can't uh, all uh, put our hay in the, in the barn. There are some breathable uh, bale wrap uh, technologies out there uh, available, but ultimately, regardless of how you're harvesting, you know, if you're making silage, make sure you get it uh, good, tightly packed. Uh, if you're putting bales outside, north and south is best. You know, don't stack them, just single rows. Uh, leave a couple of feet between them on a well-drained gravel or rock pad is really the, the way to do it. Uh, I really encourage you to look into baleage. Um, you know, if you are making dry hay and feeding it yourself, uh, there's getting to be more bale wrappers around to either rent or buy. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to, to basically harvest it maintain some leaves, and then also it gives you some of those storage advantages as well. So ultimately then with harvest and trying to minimize dry matter losses or storage losses, uh, this is one of my favorite graphs out of the, the management guide or elsewhere. We basically have moisture when harvest on the horizontal axis here and the losses on the vertical axis. So kind of wilted silage, if you're chopping it and putting in a bag or a silo, uh, we can minimize losses altogether with those strategies because we keep more of the leaves. And uh, we are gonna have a little bit higher storage losses just because uh, with that ensiling process, uh, plastic wrap bales or baleage are kind of going to be the, the next best because we can maintain some of those, those leaves a little bit higher quality and uh, can minimize some losses that way. And ultimately, when we get down to dry hay, we just have a lot more potential for harvest losses. That's why, you know, uh, baling in the, with a little bit of a tougher condition or a little bit of a dew on can help maintain or minimize some of those. But ultimately, it's just a challenge because that hay is really dry and brittle. Last thing is when to move on. <laughs> I, I equate this to the five stages of grief. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks that, you know, want to get a lot of years, five, six years out of their stand. And at the end of the day, you know, shorter lived stands of alfalfa in many cases are going to be more profitable. So after you've had three or four years out of it, don't feel bad to move on. Uh, plant corn, take that nitrogen credit, you know, in the long run, it is more economical and you can, can maintain some higher levels of production. Because uh, ultimately, like uh, the slide here from Dan Understander shows, uh, seeding year, of course, is about half of what your production years are going to be. We maximize production in the first couple of years of that, those stand, and then our yield's ultimately going to fall off uh, after a while. And, and there are some other things you consider. Maybe you can, can intercede or, or plant some other things in there, but uh, ultimately consider moving on. And I think for the sake of time, I'll go through this uh, pretty quick here and just go to my take-home points. So wherever you're at in the life of your stands this year, if you're, if you're seeding some new stuff this year, if you've, if you've got some stuff established, um, you know, here's kind of the take home points. Make sure you're selecting good varieties that yield well uh, and have the disease packages that you need can persist through, you know, at least a couple of winters. Uh, there's some other stuff with root architecture uh, that can be considered, whether it's a branching root type, uh, some traffic tolerant varieties. There's a lot of new things on the market to consider. Uh, you know, manage your fertility, insects, and diseases. Hire somebody if you don't want to, you know, uh, spend the time to, to scout. I think it's money well spent uh, as long as they're, uh, you know, uh, good, uh, good scouts are actually uh, uh, going to do it uh, the right way. Um, pay attention to those equipment settings. So that goes to anyone, uh, wherever you are at the stage of your production cycle. Uh, think about cutting height. Make sure you're maintaining those conditioners. If you've got an older, older unit uh, and you're making dry hay, uh, make sure the conditioners are, are tuned up and actually getting you to increase that drying rate beyond the 60%. Um, and don't let your hard work rot away. Uh, think about that storage structure, you know, uh, putting a better base down some rocks or gravel uh, in many cases might be money well spent and be proactive. Uh, you know, if, if it looks like a winter or you've got some older stands and you might have some uh, winter kill or injury, uh, don't be afraid to move on, plant a, a new field somewhere else and, and uh, take that nitrogen credit and move on. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention. And if there's a couple minutes for questions, uh, I see there is a number of things that have come in the chat now as well. Yeah, I, thank you so much, Jared. That was a really, really instructive talk. Um, sometimes, you know, we can get kind of lost in the in the details of um, management and it's good to have a refresher on just kind of the the basics, how to seed, how to, how to you know, successfully uh, grow all alfalfa as part of your rotation. So I really appreciate the, the talk and the time you put in. Um, yeah, I, just since we're talking about uh, uh, bales, there's several questions about that. Um, if you're net wrapping bales, is it better to have them tight in a row or more separated so they can breathe or is it not matter or what, what's the idea there? 
So in general, the recommendation, and a lot of this comes, goes back to Kevin Shinners in Wisconsin, where a lot of this kind of, uh, these ideas have come from, but butt them together. If they're dry, if they need, you know, maybe they're borderline, didn't quite have them dry enough, then give them a little bit of space, at least initially, and, and you could uh, push them together at a later point in time. But uh, in general, you can, if they're dry, you can uh, push them together. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, any um, uh, different recommendations for uh, bailing big squares versus rounds or small squares? Uh, or not not necessarily. Sorry, what was that? In terms of harvest losses? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, a lot of times, you you know, um, some of the square balers are a little bit better at holding on to some of those, uh, you know, at least losses from the bale chamber. Um, you know, the round baler, you know, those belts are open to some degree and, and you can lose some leaves and things there. Um, you know, I think some of the newer balers are a lot better at that, but in general, you might have a little bit less uh, losses with a square baler, but, uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's a question on uh, white wrapping um bales and getting mold in there um is that a function of putting up hay that's a little bit too wet or yeah so it looks like this is probably so with white wrap i assume this is for baleage so um you know especially like an inline uh wrappers so yeah, there there is a lot of times you know those little pockets where you might add a little more air uh in there you will get some of that white mold um you know, it's typically not a lot if you've done a good job. So kind of the recommendation on wrapping, hey, you need at least six mils of, of plastic wrap. So a lot of the white wrap, at least that we've used is about a mil, one mil, but then you're stretching it. So you need about maybe seven or eight wraps typically uh, on that hay. Uh, hopefully it doesn't poke through the wrap. If it is, you need, need more. Um, net wraps better to minimize the poking through the wrap. And then ultimately, um, you know, if it's an inline wrapper, you need at least a thousand pounds of pressure between bales is kind of the recommendation. Get them pushed as tight as you can together. And it's really about minimizing airspace. Uh, we want to minimize the amount of air in there. It's the same principles as, as making silage in a bag or in a, a bunker. Uh, we want to get them packed as tight as you can. And that was kind of my comment on uh, really pegging out, uh, you know, running that, riding that red line uh, on the bale chamber to uh, basically keep those bales as tight as you can to minimize air. You know, if you do all that and get them wrapped tight without holes, um, you know, protect those from any, you know, birds or anything else that might poke holes in them. Um, you know, that's about all you can do. Uh, that little bit of white mold probably isn't going to be a huge issue. Great. Uh, well, really appreciate, uh, again, Jared, you taking the time. This has been a really great discussion. Um, thanks to everyone uh, on the call for all the questions as well. I'm sorry we didn't uh, get get to everyone's uh, question, but I think you know, there were several questions that were asked about uh, rotations uh, with alfalfa and kind of optimal, um, you know, forage rotations. And I think that will be uh, come up, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of keep that question floating for some of these other uh, presenters as we go through the day. But